to everyone. Happy to have you here for our panel discussion called Immigration on Air Women's Shelters, Exploring Changing Gender Roles in Ukraine, Belarus and Russia before immigration and uh, after return. First of all, let me introduce our guests. And uh, I'm delighted to underline that we have uh, more than uh, 30,000 people who are watching our panel discussion. And so, yeah, I'm very pleased to present uh, Lina Shlipavicite, who is an artist and dedicated social activist from Lithuania, and she is also a co-author of the book called Escape from the Hell, in uh, which she collected the stories of Ukrainian women uh, who found refuge from the war in Lithuania here. And uh, I'm pleased to welcome here Olga Johannesson. She came to us from Denmark. Olga is an author of the documentary project Women in War, in which she interviewed women from Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus, Denmark, and produced great podcasts with them. And finally, Eugenia Kovalova is here. She is a Lithuanian CEO of the Ukraine Hub. Ukraine is a Vilnius-based uh, competencies center dedicated to displaced Ukrainians in Lithuania, equipping them with knowledge, skills, networks, and other tools to unleash their potential for the future of Ukraine. Thank you all for attending. And uh, I would like to start with that it is now the third year of the full-scale war that Russia started against Ukraine. Wars always affect uh, the most vulnerable uh, sections of the nations, women and children. So men uh, go to the front and uh, migration falls on the shoulders of women to protect kids. They have to immigrate to settle themselves down and uh, care for their children. With our guests, we will discuss the issues surrounding the immigration of women from three countries affected by the war started by Russia. It is difficult to overestimate uh, what Lithuania is doing for Ukraine, both on international political uh, platforms and for refugees. About uh, 41,000 Ukrainian war refugees remain here today. And in, the, in general, according to the estimates of the UN, as of February 2024, there are, there are almost 6.5 million Ukrainian refugees in the world. So I suggest uh, starting with Lina, uh, who was involved in documenting the stories of women uh, from Ukraine. Tell us a little about your project. Do you maintain communication uh, with the heroines of your stories? And what were challenges of adaptation for Ukrainian women here? Okay, thank you. It's a very wide question. I will try not to forget uh, anything, but if I will, you tell me. Uh, so, I think at first about idea. The idea of the book came quite natural to me. I think it was my way to do something about the war. And right after the war began, I met many women uh, from Ukraine, many strong women who came here escaping war. It was women from Odessa, Mariupol, uh, and frontline cities, Kiev. And I thought to myself that it would be uh, ideal to collect those stories and um, in one place uh, and to do uh, like, um, to let people know, to let people know uh, uh, you know, those stories through the sense of a natural way how women just lived their lives uh, and how war came and what we must do. Uh, and the whole idea was not only to write stories, but uh, to draw pictures, to draw portraits of women who talk, who, was, uh, who were interviewed, and uh, I thought it would be a different approach, and uh, it, the form of this um, presentation invites you not only to hear this, those stories, but to feel it through 
the lines of the faces uh, because I'm artist and this media is uh, best known for me. Uh, so uh, I'm really grateful that uh, uh, journalist uh, Palmira Galkontaite agreed to um, to do this book with me because we are co-workers here for co-writers. <laughs> And uh, she wrote those stories, but in process, you know, it was very long and very differ somehow difficult project for me because I was trying to do both, to draw a woman who sit behind uh, here, you know, and to listen stories. Um, those stories after that uh, was written by Palmira, and uh, she talked with uh, those women too. <clears throat> um, and yeah, and finally we get the book. Um, yes, uh, I'm trying to remember what I, I must do. Oh, uh, <clears throat> yeah, maybe about the experience. It was a uh, very special experience for me too, uh, because uh, not only in artistic way, but in, you know, in, it was very moving emotionally because those women was, um, came here with this horrible experience uh, who they just escaped from um, war and they agreed to you know, we agreed to go over it all again just because we wanted the world to hear them. So uh, it was very strong uh, and uh, moving uh, reaction from both women's side. And um, I really respect the choice to talk about it because it was hard for them. Um, and uh, a uh, little uh, um, idea. Um, uh, I noticed one very uh, interesting uh, detail. In order to endure the horror of the reality of war, many tried to hold on to small everyday f uh, things like rituals of the day. For example, uh, one of women uh, just cooked every day. She cooked meals and uh, uh, eat them with the, with neighbors. You know, like uh, all together. Another um, said that uh, five minutes in the in, in the day, then she was doing rituals of uh, to her face, like cleaning face and. Um, bringing, um, you know, cream um, uh, to it. It was five minutes, then she could feel, uh, you know, herself. So it's very interesting uh, detail. Uh, I think uh, those things helped somehow he, and they, when they came here to Lithuania, because it was really hard for them to live here, to be here, uh, not only because they left many, so many in Ukraine, the homes, the jobs, the beloved people, uh, some of them knew that the husbands, sons, or brothers are in war, so they was worried. Uh, about them every day, but here uh, we need to uh, to find a job to to get uh, a food to children and many many things and uh, we manage it. I saw that many Ukrainian women who came here escaping war. Uh, finally uh, found jobs here in Vilnius. Um, some of them uh, didn't, but we used another form of living here. And yeah, I know that some of them, many of them, already uh, came back to Ukraine, despite that war is still going there. I, I think 
yeah, it's really scary for me because some of them are my friends now, and I know that they are in Ukraine, in frontline cities like Zaporizhia, and sometimes I get messages, yeah, uh, we had bombs, bombing here, and neighbor's house now um, bombed. So um, I hope we will be okay. Yeah, yeah. this is a really difficult question, and um, we are going ahead. Olga, what stories so within your project, Women uh, at War, would you share with the, us uh, to convey the difficulties f that Ukrainian women faced and how they were overcome? And uh, tell us, please, about your project too, a bit. Too. Um, I think I should start by saying I've, I've been at, the at this conference the whole day and I've been listening very interesting reports, but I think I should start by saying that here I represent, I think, a little bit different society. I am uh, Russian, born as a Russian, but I live in the Nordics for the last 15 years, first in Iceland and then in Denmark for the last nine years. And my project was done on the territory of the Nordics. And this is the... The, the area which has some peculiarities as, combi as, as compared with the Baltics, for example. And I think we should start by mentioning that it is a different society. First and foremost, in this society, in the Nordics, uh, there is not much history, much common history as the Baltic shares, for example, with the countries of Belarus, of Ukraine and Russia. Uh, most of the people, they hardly heard that, you know, Belarus is a country, let alone it's a separate country. So when the war started, for most of the people, there was something happened over there. And uh, for me, when, uh, when the shock of the war came, and I think, like, for, the, for, for all of us, we started to think, like, how to make sense of this, what really happened, where we are in this situation, what, what is going on. And the same, I think, was to a larger extent to the people of the Nordics as well. What really happened? What are those countries? What are those people? So people were just trying, as compared to the Baltics, which already shared this history, quite tight history of the relationship between these countries. For the people of the Baltic, uh, Nordics, that was quite a shock. And some sort of uh, informational vacuum. And that's what I realized from, from my position, being a communicator and a journalist to some extent. That's what I should do, probably. And I started on my own to interview women from Belarus, Russia, and Ukraine who were living in the, in the, in the Nordics, because at that time Russia was uh, closing. Uh, I, as a Russian, I can go to Ukraine. I can go to Belarus. So, uh, and then at some point of time, several months into the war, uh, the Nordic Council of Ministers uh, announced in the tender, which was surprisingly mirroring the activity which I already started doing. So when I applied to this project and got the, the support of the Nordic Council of Ministers, we started this project, which on a bigger scale calls people to people, because the main uh, idea of this project was to interview people, to let them tell their stories. Below the headlines, uh, clickable headlines, below the political slogans, below the news, uh, just to let people tell the stories. Simply because we are humans and we relate to nothing better than the personal story told by another human to us. In this respect, we can understand not only other societies better, but we also can understand the humans better, the stories better, the war better. So it's not just in the news, the terrible pictures, which the news were showing everything. But this is the woman coming from the war telling her personal story. And that makes a dramatic difference in understanding. So part, big part of that was uh, making uh, documentaries, uh, interviews with women from, as I said, uh, Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia residing in the Nordic countries, simply because the target audience of the project was the people of the Nordics. And we needed to show them content which is relevant to them, understandable to them, and open to them and relevant to them, as I, as I said so. Uh, that's why we talked to the women who already been living there with them for quite some time. And as we talk about the war, we cannot talk about the war in statics. This is a very dynamic uh, uh, d d phenomenon. As we talk right now, things may be happening. We have to adjust, especially if we talk about the projects which relates to humans and to talking to people. So uh, after the year of the war, 
we decided to add up uh, uh, podcasts on the platform uh, Nordic Talks, which is uh, quite popular in the Nordics again, uh, created uh, also by the Nordic consortiums uh, alongside with the Nordic values and the goals of uh, socially sustainable green uh, uh, region. Uh, which means that primarily the postcards were about postcards uh, po podcasts were about uh, climate change innovations by economy, but then we realized that we cannot talk anymore about all these issues because there is a war going on just here. It's like not noticing the elephant in the room. So we made the Ukraine special podcast of three podcasts where we asked uh, to join me and Danish journalist Andreas Loistrom in the room. Uh, one uh, Ukrainian woman and one uh, Russian woman. And we talked about what is going on right now. Um, the aim was not to put people together for the dialogue or to try to put them for some kind of understanding. The aim was pure research to show what's going on right now because we are a year into the war right now. What is going on? What is going on with the societies? Can we really talk? Can we... What can we talk about? And some of these podcasts were really harsh, uh, and I'm personally proud of this work, because people who came there, they, talk, they spoke the truth. That means that uh, sometimes it was very difficult truth for all of us sitting there. And then, of course, as we noticed that the interest of the public grows, we started to go out and... Uh, go open to the democratic festivals in the, in the Nordics and in the Baltics. So all in all, we did six public talks plus one in, in the Nordics on democracy festivals and one in uh, Latvia and uh, Lampa festival last year. Even uh, our, every hour talk um, collected a lot of people, a lot of people. And I personally moderated these talks and I saw that every time I had to add up more and more time for question and answer section because people were just asking and asking and asking and asking questions. The most interesting and I think the most fruitful was when we had the Ung Thomas Folkemöller, uh, the uh, festival, democracy, democracy festival for the young people. When um, participants, a woman from Ukraine, a woman from Belarus and a woman from Russia, they were just taken just into pieces for talking after we finished. There's so much interest in that. And uh, Yes, all in all, this was the project. It lasted 11 months, and all in all, we talked with uh, 20 women, uh, nine Ukrainian women, six Russians, and you know, consequently from, from Baltics and uh, Belarus as well. Thank you, Olga, and for your work too. And uh, Evgenia is a person who directly provides assistance to Ukrainian women who ended up in Lithuania. So what exactly were uh, the initiatives most needed here in helping women to adapt here? Yes, thank you for, for your question. <clears throat> I just want to remind everyone what Ucreate Hub is. We are not... Um, a humanitarian assistance organization. Uh, we are an initiative that was created on the platform of Open Lithuania Foundation. And those of you who know uh, Open Lithuania Foundation or Open Societies Foundation across the world, we work with uh, uh, themes of democracy, human rights, uh, rule of law, um, promotion of democratic conversations and so on. So we're also part of the democracy festivals in, in the Baltics. So when, when we started creating you create Hub, we realized that while the very mm, basic needs of uh, Ukrainians arriving in Lithuania, they are covered by many other organizations like Caritas, Red Cross. There were some uh, civic initiatives like Stiprus Karto, uh, who were providing the necessary food, the accommodation, the, the first and the most immediate help. But when we looked at what's after, so when you have created your security, you satisfied your basic needs, you perhaps found a job, you've integrated your kids into the school, what's then? Is there something else for self-actualization, for uh, connecting, networking? And there wasn't really much. And then we created Ukraine Hub with the idea that active Ukrainians, those who are seeking for this self-actualization, they can come and find a platform here. So right now we are uh, a group of 
group. A group is a small word. Uh, we're a community of uh, almost 325 Ukrainians, mostly women, because and that reflects the the trend of migration. And um, what we do is uh, several things. So first of all, there's a lot of networking, and we realized and it comes back again and again. And just yesterday we had an event with over 30 Ukrainian creative professionals that they, they want uh, a face-to-face -face engagement. And it's so fruitful. We had to kick them out of our, of our premises because they were just missing this professional engagement, not the conversation over uh, next, at the schoolyard, but something where they can connect and talk about their professional needs. For this, so for this purpose, we created several professionally oriented clusters. So we have a cluster for creative professionals, we have a cluster for mental health specialists, Ukrainian mental health specialists. We have um, a cluster for academic uh, youth and academics, so PhD students, doctors, uh, professors. And we have women entrepreneurs in our hub. What we also do, and it proved an extremely successful way to support people, um, we have a small grants program. It's a program where we um, open up an opportunity to get a really small grant, two, three thousand euros, to implement own projects. And these, the range of these projects is is huge. Some projects are like Linus is uh, interviewing women, their experience during uh, the war, the experience of integration, and presenting it either in the form of exhibition, uh, theater, uh, or otherwise. There are also projects such as self-help groups. There are also projects that for example, analyze uh, from an international law perspective the narratives of, that Russia uses in international law and countering those narratives. So the range is huge. And what is important here is that people feel they are useful. Because every Ukrainian I work with, they do something for their community. They either collect funds for their father's military unit that is on Zaporizhia, or they collect uh, humanitarian aid. We provide an opportunity to express themselves in a different way. And it has proven to really work. And people are feeling active, useful. They can self-actualize themselves. And they can also get out of the survival mode. They can go out of this mode and do something productive. And I think that's extremely important because you can be in that sense that you can't do anything. You're frozen, and one of the ways to, to, to combat that is to do something. My further question is uh, to everyone. If you are talking about uh, the change in gender roles uh, that women face, and uh, uh, in what areas do you observe uh, such changes in gender roles? Who would like to share your thoughts? Uh, I think uh, very. Um, we really can feel that those women uh, who came here from Ukraine, for example, they must be women and men in the way because we must do everything uh, to do everything for we and life and we children's life. Uh, so I don't know is this good answer, but this. Uh, idea came to my mind um, and literally sometimes <laughs> we really feel like mm, men I had conversations with some of them you know not official officially but just uh, by the coffee and yeah we some of them said to me that it's uh, feeling that uh, Sometimes she's a woman and sometimes just a man who must work and to, to do everything what in the past she, uh, she mm, even didn't know how to do. <laughs> yeah, actually they have to do everything. Yeah, yeah. Exactly everything. Yeah. 
once again, I think I have to start saying here that I represent a sort of Nordic perspective, which means that gender roles per se is not that, you know, how to say it, very well defined in the Nordics because we do fight for equality. So we have to share the same burden, the same rights, the same duties, the same obligations. But of course, uh, for women coming from another culture, of course, it is different. And of course, um, of course, it entails changes and difficulties. And basically, a woman comes to the other side of the war and becomes a warrior itself for her own life, for the life of her children, for the life of her elderly, which is actually overlooked because when we talked about the war, we usually imagine the battlefield, right? So, but this is the war of a woman who is in her own battlefield. Um, then, of course. Having said that, in my project, I haven't had that much contact with the refugees, per se. But um, I would like to mention here the words of one of the participants, uh, strong participants, I'm very grateful for that, uh, Lesia Ignatiuk Eriksson, who, was, who is the uh, chairwoman of the Association of Ukrainians in Denmark. And she was in the second podcast, and she said, uh, when the full invasion, Russian invasion in Ukraine started, she got uh, 100 calls uh, within the first hour, and then she realized, she says, my life, I'm talking about the woman who is integrated, assimilated. She, she lives in Denmark. She has a Danish husband. She, is, she has Danish work. And she says, I realized that my life is never going to be the same again. My children were always the first thing for me, the most important thing. But then I turned to my husband and I said, now you are a mother and the father to my children. So let's say even the women who are already integrated in the society, who are not refugees, they went to war, to their personal war. And that's uh, the influence, so to say, of the gender role that entails that. And uh, Yogini, the floor is yours, please. Yeah, so I do work every day with, uh, with the Ukrainian community. I don't, want, I don't want to generalize because I don't have like social, sociological, anthropological data, but I do see the same trend is that um, women who uh, were housewives uh, suddenly uh, have to take over family business and run it uh, in, a, in, a, in a new country. And it's a huge challenge and it, there has to be like an internal transformation. But this is not to say that uh, there are uh, no Ukrainian women that I've encountered who, who've, who already represent that Nordic uh, gender um, concept, uh, somebody who is a head of a factory already. Uh, so, so it really depends, it's very individual, but I do see that. And I think one important thing to understand is that what we see, and we see that also through some uh, small researches that we made or questionnaires, is that while uh, there's a loss of professional identity, uh, so it's an additional trauma for many women. Somebody who was, who was a head of a shopping mall in Ukraine find themselves here, and because, let's say, of lack of language, uh, she cannot work in the same position. She has to go and work in a shopping mall as a cashier. And that affects so much her perception, also gender-wise. Yeah, depression. Yeah. A lot of people. So, so that's another dimension that can be explored in every indi individual case. So that's one side. Another side that I also notice uh, when working with uh, Ukrainian women, I had a couple of uh, conversations where they were telling, telling how empowered they feel by examples of Lithuanian women, because they didn't think they can be uh, a mother and uh, uh, do a career and um, just do things differently than they are used to. But again, I just wanted to kind of highlight, there are so many individual stories. Uh, there is not one trend, but there's definitely a certain shift in gender roles and different aspects affect that. The increased financial burden, for example, the change of professional identity, the separation from husband uh, or extended family, all those factors affect how women perceive themselves and perceive their yeah, gender. Yeah, I would say it must be a huge discussion just on this topic because uh, there are 
it's really so that uh, female and male roles are gender roles. I mean, uh, they are blurred right now, as uh, Olga pointed to, pointed out this. And uh, yeah, it's very difficult to be uh, so precise in, on this topic. And if I can add, we have to think ahead what will happen after the war. Because while women are here or in Nordics um, embracing a different, some of them, not all, yeah, some of them embracing a different uh, gender, uh, gender role, the men who are on the front line uh, are in a different dimension completely. And what will happen when these two meet? I think like those who are doing foresights for societal change in Ukraine, they have to think about that moment because from, from what I imagine, it's going to be an explosion. Yeah, that's right. And uh, in a different way, but uh, there will also affect the uh, women from Russia and Belarus, uh, Belarus because both of those countries are involved in the aggression against Ukraine. And uh, you, Olga, researched uh, this issue. Could you share with us uh, your experience on this? About uh, how the war affected... I mean, uh, your experience uh, with the conversations with the people from women from Russia and Belarus and uh, what uh, difficulties uh, they experience? Um, again, primarily, I think I have to start always from the background, the Nordics, uh, and the women who did not particularly flee from, um, from the war, especially when we talk about uh, Belarusians and Russian women. Um, then talking about that, that, that actually this question I asked, this was the first opening question in every interview that I took. Uh, what was, how, how do you remember your um, day of the Russian full-scale invasion into Ukraine? And how do you feel now? So to follow up. And here, interestingly, but not surprisingly, the answer is no different from the refugee women who flee from the war. Um, the answer would be that the effect was just devastating and the crush of the identity. Because in a different way for women who flee from the war, it's a crush of identity, the same way as we mentioned here, because they have to identify and find themselves who they are now, who, who, what, what they're supposed to do. The same, surprisingly, for the women who have been already integrated in the Nordic society and have been living there and who haven't fled from war. I can also reach those lines of women, and I can also speak from my experience. Uh, that's um, the question, who you are in this world? What can you do? Uh, how can you function? How can you live with this, let's say, was it uh, Cain's temp, which is on you right now forever? Are you responsible or are you guilty? I mean, are you, are you sh what should you do? So all these women and me, in line with them, we were asking the same question. And I don't think we will ever find the answer to the question, except again, one thing, as we discussed here and also in the previous panels, just find the purpose to do something today, to help someone today, to do something. And it works for everyone, for refugee women or for women from Russia, for Belarus, who've been living already in the Nordics for quite some time. Thank you. Would uh, Lina and uh, Eugenia would like to add something here? Well, I don't work with uh, Belarusian or uh, Russian women, but uh, I can speak about myself. And I, I would be curious also to hear Olga, because we, as someone who grew up in Lithuania, uh, has never lived in Russia, but I have Russian uh, background. And I clearly remember the day the war started. I clearly remember the day Putin made his speech a couple of days before the war. And it, it crushed my identity. I questioned, can I speak to my children in Russian? Uh, what do I do with it? Do I read Pushkin or do I throw <laughs> his books away? I mean, it's... It, and at the same time, there was a, um, a huge guilt. Uh, and I think this is a conversation we had with uh, many Lithuanians with some Russian background. I cannot feel any of these things. I cannot bring them to the surface because this is incomparable to what Ukrainians have to go through right now. So 
I'm really curious yeah, also about Olga's experience, maybe, maybe during the coffee break. I mean, it does, I believe it does affect those who are conscious enough, uh, but I cannot speak of, about anybody else except for myself. Let's now discuss the impact uh, of uh, migration has uh, what uh, has on uh, societies in those countries where refugees ended up. And uh, this applies to both negative and positive things. So, um, Lina, would you like to share your thoughts? Um, the question is about... It's uh, about the uh, impact on uh, societies. Oh, on okay. Yeah, I think... Um, I think that this migration thing, uh, because of war, uh, yeah, it has really sad side, bad side, but it has, in my opinion, it has beautiful and good uh, side because uh, those Ukraine, Ukrainian, um, we came, we come here with uh, the culture, the sense of uh, world, the understanding, the. Uh, you know, knowings and uh, everything, uh, you know, came here to Lithuania like rivers, you know. And I think for Lithuanians it's good to have uh, this um, opportunity to um, accept, accept with peop those people and uh, different cultures uh, working together. Uh, because, uh, yeah, we are a very little country and uh, we have, as Lithuanians, we have uh, many fears about different things. And in this situation, I can feel that uh, hearts of Lithuanians uh, opening a little bit more. <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's poetically said, but I feel so. Maybe Olga won't. Once again, I think I'll start with my own refrain. Um, I'm going to speak about the Nordics. That means that it's a little different perspective again. Um, Nordics as a society is quite different from the uh, Middle Europe, Western Europe, uh, and uh, Southern Europe. It is already, by definition, a much closed society. Um, I can speak so from my own experience living there 15 years and married to an Icelandic husband. First, I lived six years in Iceland and then nine years in, in Denmark. And I can understand how people live in much smaller communities, not because they don't like anyone else, but because they just respect their own privacy and the privacy of the other person. That's why it's difficult to integrate there, assimilate with them, let alone assimilation, just to integrate there, even without such difficult situation as the war, for example, or if you're fleeing from somewhere, or fleeing from a rather different culture as Western European culture, Russia, Ukraine, Belarus are. Um, and for the Nordics, that was, I think that was, again, this is my observation, that's not statistics, uh, but my purely observation, that it was a bit difficult to adjust to the fact that so many Ukrainians are coming basically within a day within months, first months, second months, third months, there are more and more and more coming. And um, I can speak for two countries, uh, particularly for Iceland and for Denmark, and I see how the society opened up. Personally, I have never seen it myself before. Uh, and there was a lot of welcoming, there was a lot of understanding how people started to learn Ukrainian. The Ukrainian language courses became the most important, the most famous courses in the uh, study school in the language schools in, uh, in Denmark. Danish people started to learn Ukrainian just to be able to communicate with Ukrainians. And again, I'll give a personal example because I believe that personal stories are the most powerful stories. When we started to do the podcasts and I was, uh, my, my co-host was Andreas Floystrup, the journalist from Danish uh, television. And he was um, quite self-assured you know, Danish television and everything. And we were recording this podcast. And so when we joined in the studio, and here we are sitting with a Ukrainian woman, a Russian woman, and me and him, and a Ukrainian woman tells how she goes, saves her child, and sees the other children dead. And her husband is dead on her own eyes, and she starts crying. And um, after the third podcast, I see how much change, how much it changed my co-host. 
he became, I think he became, I can say that he became a deeper and wiser man for that. Because for several hours he's been sitting in a room listening to the powerful stories. And that's also in a smaller, very refined way, the result of what our project had on the larger people. When people hear personal stories, they can never get away from that anymore. That becomes a part of their life and they understand better. I would like to talk about another sensitive topic, uh, extremely sensitive, which is also the idea of uh, the our project, uh, the attempt to build a dialogue between Ukrainians and uh, on the one hand and uh, Russians and Belarusians on the other one. Ukrainians uh, unmasked say that this is not inappropriate uh, right now, and uh, I know that uh, Evgenia has something <laughs> to say about it. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Yeah, um, because we, uh, we talked with Angela before the, um, the session about um, the title. And I also have to share that when we shared the invitation to listen to this conference with our uh, Ukraine community, which are Ukrainians, there were questions raised. Why, again, somebody put together Ukrainians, Russians and Belarusians? And I completely understand the question, the validity of the question. It's so sensitive. Um, you know, when, when uh, a member of Ukraine community starts crying just by mentioning her hometown name, and then, some, like, and then if there is, there is somebody talking about let's create a dialogue, it's just too far. It's not the right time. And I think it's, it's, it's so important to understand that nobody else but Ukrainians themselves should decide when they are ready for the dialogue, uh, for that conversation. And I know some of the, of the community members, they work with Belarusians, and it's okay, it's a personal choice. But let's say we as an organization, we cannot in no way impose such a such a frame, let's have a dialogue. So we are very, very cautious about it. And uh, um, whenever, let's say we had, a, again, a, maybe a, a specific story, we had a, uh, a discussion at the Ukraine Hub about Sustainable Peace Manifesto. Sustainable Peace Manifesto is a document prepared by Ukrainian civil society leaders, by uh, academics, prominent uh, intellectuals, it, it, there's a huge list of signatories to that document. And it outlines um, in many pages all the conditions that are needed for sustainable peace, not just for peace as a, as a, as a no armed conflict anymore, but as a peace that remains there, that can last for a long time. And it involves such difficult things as decolonization of Russian history, decolonization of the mentality, uh, dismantling certain structures. There's a lot of different things in it. And for this discussion, uh, with the permission of uh, our speakers, we invited both Belarusian and Russian activists who reside in Lithuania, and it was so hot. <laughs> they, were, they, they themselves felt both guilt and not being in the right place, and the Ukrainians were just rightfully so very, you know, steadfast. You know, this is this is our conditions, and I think this is the right way to 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 have that. It's the Ukrainians and their decision when to have the dialogue together, and we cannot we cannot impose or expect them to be in the room and be amiable and friendly. And I mean, this is a frame that we are working with uh, in Ukraine Hub, and it's very, it's very important for us because we want to Ukrainians to drive what they do at the Ukraine Hub. Thank you for your opinion, and uh, I spoke uh, with the Olga. I would, yeah, I, I would like to add something from myself, and uh, I I spoke with Olga about this issue too. So, and uh, I would like to underline that she had a really difficult task to moderate conversations uh, between uh, Ukrainian and Russian women. And it was difficult from uh, starting with the finding speakers for such conversations and uh, ending with the talks itself. 
And uh, could you honestly to share with us these stories? I mean that, uh, I'm sorry that uh, I would say this, uh, but uh, you told me that a lot of people just refuse to talk with you. I like when you say honestly, because previously what I said was just, you know, like for the yeah, public. Yeah, it was uh, quite briefly, I would say. <laughs> yeah, and now So I'm I'll try like honestly this time, all right. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, um, yes, um, this is a difficult topic and a difficult project. And uh, again, I have to underline that when we deal with the not static dynamic phenomena as war, uh, we have to adapt constantly. When the war started several months into that, we all were thinking, okay, maybe it's just gonna end soon. You know, they have to come with something. They have to negotiate. They have to withdraw the troops, you know. And that was the time when this uh, project was announced. And that's why one of the questions, one of the aims of this project was to study if this understanding and dialogue is possible. Once again, we have to pay attention to the timing because it's crucial here. One year into the war, when we decided to record podcasts, it was quite different understanding already and it was clear to everyone that okay there is no dialogue let alone understanding and that's why we asked uh, women to share what they think and this podcast were as I said already were one of the mo most difficult things that I had to do because it was truthful see I'm speaking honestly <laughs> anyway <clears throat> and uh, of course when you second year into the war and you write to Ukrainian, you call to Ukrainian and ask Ukrainian woman, can you join this project every time, every time for this 10 months? Well, it was a bit bigger but time, but every time I started communication by saying I am Russian and it's the most difficult thing for me to say right now, but I have to get it straight. If you have problem with that, I understand it, I respect that. And... It requires a lot of trust to know either me personally, where I come from, what I believe in, or to know someone who knows me. And that's why those women, they agreed to take part in the projects. So without this trust, it won't be happening. And I also, I understand that. I understand that very, very much. Um, I think I lost some, uh, some important thought, I think, but Yes, and about dialogue and understanding. Uh, and it was second year into the war when the public talk started to happen at the democracy festivals. It was clear to everyone because every Ukrainian, every Russian woman said, understood and said that it's not time for understanding. It's not time for dialogue. I personally believe that as well. This is not time for understanding right now. This is not time for dialogue. And this is true, it's up to Ukrainians to decide when they are ready to start this dialogue or ready to make a step towards some kind of understanding. And we understand here that a lot would have to be done for that to happen. Yet, having said that, yet I would like to again speak about this project and that we managed to get Ukrainian women at one panel six or seven times, in one podcast room three times, in several documentaries that shows that there is a possibility for this dialogue. And for now, this is a big finding and a big result. And for that, I'm very happy. Because me, personally, as a Russian, it gives a lot of hope for me and my country being forgiven and for the dialogue to be possible. Thank you. Lina, would you like to express your opinion on this? I think I um, can't say better than most women. So... Uh, no, I don't want to. Thank ask. you. And uh, another topic what I would like to discuss today is uh, returning back to, for example, for Ukrainian women. And uh, some opinion polls shows, uh, show that uh, refugees want to return home less and less uh, from year to year. Just uh, how would you explain why people find it increasingly difficult to go back home? I mean, uh, not only, like, uh, of course, war is, uh, is ongoing, it's dangerous for just, uh, for lives, for health, but uh, something in addition. Yeah. There are different numbers, different studies, and they change. They change with the changes in the front line, actually. 
uh, we see that so clearly among our community. There's somebody who has packed their bags and said, we're going to leave in February, and in February something happens and they have to unpack and, and uh, stay. And I noticed something, uh, like if we talk about challenges that uh, Ukrainians face in Lithuania, is the sense of temporarily, temporarily, is that being ha like hanging in between, you, you think that maybe soon it will be over, so you don't really root yourself in the host country because you're waiting for that moment and it never comes. So how long can you wait until you decide, okay, I stay here? And I think it changes so much for every person. One day they are looking maybe at Kiev and they're thinking, oh, I will go back. The next day there's a huge um, air, air attack by I don't know how many rockets and they think, no way, I will go back. And still, there, there, are, there are a lot of, uh, like Lina was mentioning, a lot of uh, Ukrainians that I know that went back already. So, according to our little survey, half of, of uh, women, or let's say half of uh, I women that we interviewed, already have decided that they will stay. Because how long can you be in this temporary position? It, it affects so much your mental health. Then you, your kids integrate, you put them into school, they start learning the language, they speak the language, so that, of course, affects their decision. I think what I would like to say here, for us at Ukraine Hub, one of the messages that we, one of the narratives that we use when we work with the Ukrainians, we say, it doesn't matter where you are. Whether you are in Lithuania today or you come back to Ukraine tomorrow or you move to Germany, you are a resource for your country. You can do something for it today. It doesn't matter where you are. And I think, mm, I hope, I hope, uh, I know Ukrainian government is preoccupied with completely different things right now, and rightly so. But I hope that more and more people see Ukrainians abroad, not just as refugees who were fleeing the war and some of them don't have where to go back because their cities are destroyed completely um, so but i hope that everybody sees ukrainians as that resource that can be useful both for the host country for ukraine uh, because each one of my community members they're extremely amazing people with so many good skills good competence and it's just just need to sometimes to push them a little bit to uh, to create to 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 rebuild to start rebuilding their country already now yeah unfortunately we have used up all our time and uh, I would like to propose anyways uh, to share maybe some of your conclusions in just uh, one minute for everyone I think I said my conclusions <laughs> <laughs> okay. um. I don't know. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for inviting because it's really interesting for me to listen this conversation and to listen about uh, Eugenia speak and Olga because we have different experiences about this topic. So, and I think dialogue is always a good solution. Yeah. And I wanted to add uh, something what you told, Eugenia. Uh, I also think that it's, I think we must um, know that and Ukrainian uh, people to know that mm, uh, no matter where you are, but very matter what you do and what you do with that, with this situation. Well, just to echo everyone who sits here, I'm, again, very happy to be here, and thank you very much for inviting me here. Although I have to confession to make here, when I got the email from Delphi, and I looked at it, I think, for half an hour, and then I returned in the next day. That's the reason I haven't been replying for the first four days. Because I honestly have been considering, should I go back into that? Because for me, it has been the most difficult 11 months of my life. I'm not a trained psychologist, and I didn't have psychologists with me. And every day I was with people with trauma. 
And I think this is what we tend to overlook. Also, when I heard all these uh, discussions today, when we discussed about integration or even adaptation, and there were psychologists sitting here, why they learn language, why they don't learn the language, is it important to learn the language, you know, all of these things. But then we forget about this thing. These women, actually both, all of them, Russian, Belarusian, and mo mostly Ukrainian, come from a great trauma, and the war is a great trauma. And I think this aspect is quite overlooked in most of the countries who deals with the refugees. Because before you ask a person to integrate or learn the language, ask that person if the person feels safe, if the person sleeps well in the night, does the person have anyone to talk to, again, in which language? Because then it's a barrier, right? It, can she talk to her friends who are at the same, sharing the same trauma? So for, for, for many, for, for quite some time right now, these refugee women are boiling in their own bubbles and that actually does not allow even their brain to step out and learn the language or integrate or do something creative or find themselves anymore. There's a lot of work to do for these women, for all of us. And I think this, I would like to encourage to address this issue also in the next conferences or in next dialogues, just to first treat the trauma and then everything would be fine because women are the most powerful, I would like to say creatures, but I would like to say humans. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you a lot and thank you for attending and sharing your experiences and uh, you have provided much food for the thoughts. Thank you. Thank you.